Hey everyone, so I just want to <laughs> apologize. I forgot to hit my go live button and I was sitting here for a couple of minutes so I apologize that I'm eight minutes late. But in any case, thank you so much for coming for another AMA. I have gotten so many questions in the past week about medical coding that I thought it would be a great idea to pop, pop on not just to answer the you know, dozen or so questions that I've gotten in the past week through the comments and DMs that I haven't gotten a chance to get to yet, but also some of your questions to answer those live as well. So before we get started, I wanted to show off, I got some really cool new swag. And if can someone can in the chat, just let me know if you can hear me okay, because I know there were some audio issues last time and I don't want to have a repeat of that. So I got some from the last AAPC conference I was on. They started a uh, little uh, Squarespace store and I got these cute little AAPC scrunchies. Can you see them there? Aren't they cute? So um, I got a gray one and a, a navy one. So I think those are cute. This is the new style, right? I think in for young girls, like wearing the scrunchies on your, your, uh, your um, wrist is a thing again, right? So hi, Lillian Green. Hi, Mary. Hi, Jeff Gassette. Hi oh, Seno Benny, I'm glad to see you here. You're always here supporting me. Thank you so, so much. So one of the first questions that I've gotten recently, and I get this a lot, so it's really important to go over, is what are the prerequisites for medical coding? So the AAPC does not have mandatory prerequisites for any of their certifications. AHIMA does have for some of them. Um, they do have a certified coding associate that doesn't have mandatory reg um, mandatory prerequisites. But the things that I will say are very highly recommended are to know medical terminology and to know anatomy and physiology. And there are some fairly cheaper resources online that you can find to do that, like some just, you know, one shop sort of medterm class or uh, an anatomy class. And I'll link some other resources below when I'm done with the stream, but I know there is, I always recommend it's called Crash Course. You can find it on YouTube. It'll teach you anatomy and physiology, and it's, it's very exciting, very wonderful. And the other thing that I recommend as far as medterm is there is like a medical terminology for dummies book. And there's also, I really like these, I recommend them, the medical terminology flashcards. There's actually a thousand of them in this box. I think it's under $20 on Amazon. Uh, at the end of the stream, I'll link those in the, com in the uh, description of this. But they're really cool because there's just like a thousand different cards in here for you to practice. Some of them are ones that I probably in my, you know, dozen years in medical coding have never actually used, but... Uh, it's really helpful. So you can sort through. They're sorted by, I think, category. So here, for example, this one will tell you mega or megalo, and that means large. So it's a great way to just practice med term to just go through the flashcards. Uh, I've, I've found them very helpful. There's a, like I said, they're, they're cheap on Amazon, and it really helps you learn some medical terminology. And I've even picked up some stuff working with them that I haven't in the past. I need a sip of tea already. Okay. Another question that I've gotten recently, and I think this is an important one to discuss, is what's the stress level for medical coding? So much like any other type of office job or business job, that can really depend on a lot of different factors. One of them is, you know, your boss. If you have a really crummy boss that doesn't support you, that's obviously going to increase your stress levels. If you're working for an organization that's constantly asking you to work overtime, that could increase your stress levels. Under normal average circumstances, I would say it's not a terribly high stress job. There are high stress factors like there are in just about every position. You know, there's days that you have that are bad, but I would say generally 80%, 85, 90% of medical coding is fairly stress-free. Now, of course, when you get an, a, you know, a monthly or quarterly audit and find out you know, that there might be something that you've been plugging along and didn't realize it was correct, that would certainly be stressful. But for the majority of the time, I would say that medical coding is not a super high stress job.
So those of you in the chat, I just want to remind you, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up. And then if you have any questions, make sure you drop them in the chat because I am watching you guys. And those of you that are subscribed to membership, you do have access to custom emojis. You can use those in the bottom. There's some cute little ones that have me holding the CPT book and holding the ICD book. And then some other just like exclusive emojis that you guys are allowed to use in live chat. If you're interested in joining membership, membership is very cheap. Uh, it just helps support me and the channel. It's a couple dollars every month and there's different tiers available. So another question I got is, can you please talk about how you got a remote job in the field? My school tells us that most companies want you to work six months to a year before you can work remote. And with the recent pandemic things, uh, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on getting a, a remote job now? So what this is basically asking is, you know, with the pandemic, there's been a big rush of people that are suddenly working from home that probably previously hadn't been working from home. You know, teleworking is being a lot more promoted because of the situation. Now, previously, I can say that that is true, that most organizations did want you to have some time under your belt before they would send you home. I think most common, they would say, hey, we'll start you out in the office. And then once you've reached a certain amount of accuracy after six months, a year, what have you, we'll allow you to start working remotely. Now, having said that, with the pandemic, I personally haven't seen a lot of changes. Um, I know some people that do have remote options were still held to that standard that they had to wait until they had proved a certain amount of accuracy through a certain amount of time before they were allowed to work full time remote. I personally, my job was full time in office and then transitioned to part time remote and then full time remote. I wouldn't be surprised if there is an increase in employers that are more willing to start people out remotely. I think because of the nature of what we've now been through, they're starting to realize there are accommodations they can make, that there are ways to conduct training and orientation virtually, where previously they may have had you come on site. So I do think there's going to be an increase in organizations that do allow remote coders maybe sooner or with less experience, but that still is kind of a little fuzzy to as, you know, the percentage of organizations that will do that and what those kind of um, structures are going to look like as far as, you know, if it's going to be people who just passed their exam, if it's going to be people that only have six months, one month, one year, um, you know, we'll have to see. Seno Benny says she couldn't find any local chapters near her area. <sighs> you know, there are some areas that it, it is hard to find a local chapter, particularly I know out sometimes in the Midwest, they're very um, far apart. So what the AAPC does is they will assign you a chapter based on your zip code. So whatever chapter is closest to you based off of your zip code, you can, uh, you're automatically assigned to a chapter there. So I have some cha two chapters that are fairly close to each to me based off of zip code, like one's in one direction and one's in the other. Um, and I was automatically assigned to one and reassigned to the other. So Seno, maybe if you have a chapter that's maybe not super, super close to you, but they're having remote meetings right now, like regularly, you can assign, you can change your assignment to that chapter. So that way you make sure, or you could just subscribe to their alerts. So a lot of times they'll let you roam around. So I actually go to several different chapters. I'm in, uh, Eastern Pennsylvania and I'll go to Philadelphia, Lancaster, Reading, Allentown. So they use the rule of thumb of like a hundred miles, but it's more of a rough thing because you know there's other areas that are more sparse versus the areas that I'm in where I probably have you know seven or eight chapters at least within a hundred miles. So I have a question here from Jay Smoove. It says, is it easy to get all the information physician from physicians needed in order to code remotely? Or is there a lot a back and forth to get it, which was likely stressful? Um, it depends. There's certain, it's, it's kind of a culture thing. Certain physician groups, they just have really great culture. The physicians are so great at getting back to you. Um, and you know, they, they know what they have to do. Others, there's still some that you have to pull teeth with. 
I've had physicians that I know have been in practice for 20 years and will say, hey, you know, something was not uh, completed in your medical record in order for me to code it. I need you to document uh, square centimeters or what an atomic location or something and they'll tell me they've never been asked to correct a record in the 20 years that they've been in practice and they don't know how to do it. And I hear that from some of my other friends that work in physician education specifically. So it, it depends on a lot of factors but in most cases I found that physicians they understand even if it's somewhat reluctantly uh, they do understand that this is required in order for them to get their RVUs or get their payments to keep the lights on etc etc so most of them may uh, kick a little bit but they will ultimately get you the information and you know you will have ones that you have to go back and forth a little bit on and you know that's when you just kind of have to intervene get your manager's attention and say hey you know I'm having trouble with Dr. Williams, he's not getting back to me, you know, and just kind of go up the ladder with them. And usually uh, after they've kind of taken it up the chain of command, that provider will, will be more amenable to, to um, putting that information in the documentation going forward so you don't have to. You know, after a while of being requested to correct and correct and correct and correct, usually the light bulb goes off and go, oh, maybe I should just start putting this in in the first place so that I stop getting all these annoying emails. So the next question I have is I was asked, do you have set hours to work if you're working from home or is it flexible? Like, can you drop off your kids and uh, for school and then pick them up, you know, and take that time off in between? That again, it depends by your employer. There are certain employers that are very, very strict. They're like, if you log on at eight o'clock, you are expected to be there until eight o'clock, until four o'clock when you clock out. Others will allow you uh, intermittent breaks if you need them for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour or whatever. Some people will just say, hey, we want you to get eight hours of work done. However you get that eight hours of work done in a day, you know, that's up to you, but we expect you to get eight hours of work done. So uh, there are certain organizations that are fairly flexible, but then there's others just because, and maybe historically they've been taken advantage of, so they're less likely to do it, um, that are very strict. I know there's some even pretty popular organizations that hire coders that will not even allow you to take a vacation day within the first several months that you've been employed with them. So again, it just really depends on your employer. So those are really important questions to ask when you're doing your interviews. If that's something that's gonna kind of make or break you, like you need that extra time to pick up your kids or drop them off or that little flexibility, that's something you wanna start questioning about in your interview because you don't wanna take the job and then find out that it's not the right fit because of your schedule. So the next question I have is, what are your thoughts on starting with the CCA certification instead of CPC? So that really depends too on what kind of coding you like to do. So the CPC is for professional coding, so it's working with ICD codes, with CPT codes, with HCPCS codes, billing for provider-based services. The CCS is an inpatient certification. Both of them don't have mandatory pre, uh, prerequisites, so that's kind of similar between both of them, but the CCS is more inpatient driven. So it's gonna all, it's not gonna test you, I don't think at all on HCPCS, if I remember correctly from the AHEMA website, but it's gonna co uh, test you on ICD-10 PCS, and it's also gonna test you on DRGs and inpatient facility coding. So it really depends on what type of coding you prefer. Ultimately, you know, it, it's about your happiness. What kind of coding are you more happy doing? Are you more happy doing provider-based services, office visits, surgeries, or do you want to do the hospital visits for the DRGs and that kind of thing? So Lillian has a question here. She says, my questions are guidance on career path. I want to be as marked as possible once I pass my CPC on September 30th. And you, you will, Lillian. Um, then begin the COC, which was free, and then pass, she wants to take that in December and pass it. And then she says, should I get my AMBA certification? I believe that's what the American Medical Billing Association. I would say if you're gonna get a billing certification, 
go ahead and get that through the AAPC as well, unless you've got some sort of super discount that, that that's also free, because I have not found that the certifications through anyone other than AHIMA or the AAPC are the ones that employers are really looking for. So when people get things through like the NHA or the AMBA, you know, they have more trouble finding positions with those certifications because it's not something that employers are looking for. So if you're looking at that job application and it says, here's the requirements that we're listing, there's usually not AMBA and um, NHA credentials listed there. There is another one, um, the CRCR through the Healthcare Financial, HCFA Healthcare Financial something association, I think. And that one I'm seeing pick up a lot more, which is a general like revenue cycle type of certification. So that one I think people are really starting to jump on board with. Seno, so Seno says she's still figuring out whether to take the online exam or the in-person exam. I like to underline and circle the keywords to find the right answers. So Seno, uh, you know, the in-person exams right now are kind of limited. What I can tell you is with the circling highlighting thing. The only thing you're allowed in the online exam is a whiteboard. So you can't have papers, you can't write anything down, you're just allowed a, a, a whiteboard and you have to kind of show it to your proctor and show that there's nothing written on it. And then at the end, after you've written and done that, um, wipe it off and show it to them again. So if you feel you can somehow transition your circling and highlighting onto a whiteboard, then you can probably be okay with taking it um, online. Otherwise, I would suggest probably wait and try and find one in person. I actually know someone who did their exam online and is willing to come and do an interview with me for the channel. So I have that scheduled for next weekend. And then I have someone, and I haven't talked to her yet, Marissa, if you're watching, um, that I also know took it uh, in person and did really, really, really well. And I'd like to do like a compare and contrast and bring both these people on and do interviews with each of them for the channel. So you can see some first hand people that took it online and passed and then took it in person exam uh, and what those kind of um, uh, experiences of both of them are with the pros and cons. So I think that'll really help some people out. So another question I have is, what exactly is a 15 month certificate considered or called specifically since it's not an associates or a two year school? Is it worth the time and effort to do 15 months? And would a majority of that certification transfer to a two year or benefit advanced training? So my thought is if you're gonna do 15 months, you might as well do two years and get the associates degree. If it's a certification, like it's that's not a degree, usually they just call it a diploma or a certificate in medical billing and coding. Um, sometimes depending on your college, they will transfer that to a two year degree. My courses that I took, oh my gosh, 14, I think years ago now at my community college says that they will take the certificate courses I took and transfer a good majority of them onto an associate's degree program if I would be so inclined. And sometimes I am tempted because they do allow also for life experience. So I bet I could probably just take that and the life experience and probably get my associates if I really wanted to. Um, but it, personally, if I was starting over again today, I would go for an associate's degree program because that way, if I found myself in a situation 10, 20 years down the line where I thought, you know what, I wanna get into management or I wanna get into compliance or I wanna get into something where I then would need a bachelor's degree, I would already have the associates and could build from there. So if I was starting today, that's what I would do. I would go ahead and, and start with that associate's degree. And so many colleges, especially community colleges, if you go through them, you can get really good financial aid, you can get really good, um, uh, transfers into bigger bachelor's degree programs for through other areas, uh, discounted fees, and they have a lot of them online or accelerated programs that are really, really great. Someone asked, can someone without coding experience prep for the CCS instead of the CPC? Now I'm not 100% aware of AHIMA's criteria, but check on the AHIMA website for their CCS because I do think there are 
certain requirements that they have prior to sitting for the CCS. So if you want to get into inpatient coding, I believe you have to go through their CCA, the certified, I always get it wrong, certified coding associate, which does not have those prerequisite requirements. And if someone in the chat knows, just drop that in the comments and help them out. Um, my channel is beyond awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So, uh, da -da 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 -da. Madison says, okay, so I know it probably depends, but I am looking for a career path with guaranteed remote coding position <laughs> Would COC or CIC be better for remote. Would hospitals or offices hire more remote? I think it's probably 50, 50. Although I don't see a lot of COC requests specifically. A lot of the um, jobs that are open for outpatient coding will also take a CPC. I think the CPC is the probably most popular, most common coding credential that people get. It casts a pretty wide net of different types of coding um, job opportunities that you can get. If I was starting out today, what I would probably do would be to get my CPC in professional coding and then also get my CPB in billing. So that way, if I could not, and this happened to me and, and a lot of my friends, uh, couldn't get a job in coding right away. You know, that's one of the big struggles we have with medical coding is once we, we get certified in medical coding, we're like, I want a coding job because I'm a coder and that's what I do, I'm a coder. Um, and it's heartbreaking when you get there and you find out that people want you to start off somewhere else, not in coding. So if you can't find a job in coding, oftentimes you can find a job in billing somewhere in doing pre-authorizations and doing scheduling, registration, accounts receivable. And once you're in and they're already paying for your benefits, they've already got you trained, you know the EMR, you know the system, you know the players in the field, they'll be more apt to bump you up and transfer you into a coding position. And I've seen a lot of organizations lately that will allow you to transfer in as little as three months. Um, you know, it used to be back in the day, it would be like, oh, well, you can't transfer for six months, nine months, a year. But they're especially, you know, if, if they can prove to HR like they really need you, a lot of times they'll they'll let that slide through. Uh, Little Diva 711 says, I took it in person and I'm waiting for my results. Fingers crossed, you know, one of the things I see people a lot say that have been in medical coding for a long time, like I have, like when people post online and they're like, oh, I can't wait for my results. It's been three days and it's been torture. And I'm like, they, they like to respond and go, oh, well, back in the day, it took us three weeks, four weeks, a month, and you had to wait for mail. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are waiting for two minutes or two months, those two minutes will be absolute. <laughs> Torture, absolute torture. So I have sympathy for everyone that has to wait even two minutes or two hours or two weeks or two days or whatever for their results. It's like, and then when you get them, and I think I've talked about this in the past before, like when I was in social hour with the AAPC, when I got my results for my, for my CPC exam, I was like, I, I screamed so loud that they could hear me throughout the entire central billing office because I was just so, so excited. Mary S says, which coding jobs pay better? My exam instructor was saying cardiac coding makes 30 to $40 an hour. I think there definitely are types of coding that pay quite a bit more. Uh, I actually discussed this in, there's a video I made called Six Figure Medical Coding, and it talks about how you can kind of maximize your earning potential as a medical coder and that there are certain specialties that do pay more. Cardiac is a little bit higher cardiac interventional radiology is very high. Interventional radiology is, is very high. They're very in demand and they're paying very good salaries for interventional radiology coders. Inpatient DRG is another one, uh, especially the validation audits. You can get a lot of money, a lot of money. Now that's not something you can do right out of the gate. That's something you have to build up to over a few years to getting a good income. And if you listen to my podcast on my website, contempocoding.com, I actually just interviewed someone who makes a very good money working in DRG uh, validation and talks a little bit about her journey. So that might be something you wanna check out. Her name's Elizabeth Burke, she's fantastic. So yeah, if you're gonna get though into inpatient DRG coding, I would get, I would go through, the, through a HEMA and get their CCS certification because that's gonna that's gonna be the one that's specifically geared toward inpatient and DRG coding. 
if you want to get into professional coding and do that, like interventional radiology or those really uh, intense specialty things, like anything often re relating to cancer, tends to pay more because those are ones that get reimbursed a lot. Um, if you're going to do professional coding, go through AAPC and get your CPC certification. Uh, oh, gosh, I get this a lot. Which online schools do I recommend? So here's what I'll say. If you have a community college or a technical school near you that's good, go through them. Um, online schools, my default is always going to be the AAPC. I think, you know, if you're especially going to get any of their certifications, you want to go directly through them. Um, there are other, the Andrew School I've always heard is very good. Um, people say good things about integrity coding. I am personally opening up my CPC prep course, um, hoping to have it up in October. I actually was just working on midterm slides yesterday, getting those recorded and uploaded because the I want to I want to include midterm in it because I have so many people that are students and don't know midterm because they're just starting out, and so I'm just going to include like a really fun midterm kind of thing. And then if you want to supplement with things like the flashcards, that's great too. Um, but I'm hoping to have that launched in October and I can even show you. So I've been working on the PowerPoint slides. Where's my mouse? This is what happens when you have too many windows open. Lost my mouse. There it goes. Okay, so if I look over here, so here's some of the slides that I'm going to be working on for my program and it's going to kind of like, this is just in, in preview mode, but this is how my course is going to be kind of set up. It's going to be like you can see me in the little box over here, and then if I need to disappear me for any reason, I can just go ahead and do that so you can see the slide, and it's going to be me, and I'm going to be, you know, reading over the notes that I have for the slide and showing you all the different stuff. So I'm still working that out as far as getting it all together and pricing and that stuff, and then I'm also going to have a just CPC course prep like you would get through your local chapters of the AAPC where it just gets you all the information that you need to prepare specifically for the CPC exam. Uh, JMove says he likes, and I apologize, I'm not sure if it's a he or a she, but J JSmove <laughs> says Berkeley Community College Online was the best and they have job placement too, so that might be a good option. Uh, JSmove says this, that's great. So let's see, what's next? Hi, if I'm going to take medical coding, what's the most important subject to study beforehand? Definitely medical terminology. I would absolutely say medical terminology. I think the med term is really crucial, even more so than the anatomy and physiology or even pharmacology. Pharmacology, I found, is something that I often will just Google when I'm working in real life. If there's some kind of medication that I'm not familiar with, um, or they used a uh, generic name and I only know it by the brand name and I have to Google it. So I think just knowing the med term, especially from a speed perspective. So, you know, when you're doing medical coding, you're going to have certain amounts of speed that you're going to have to have. So you have to keep up the pace with coding so many charts an hour or uh, notes an hour. So I would say... Um, yeah, definitely the med term is the most important because you, as you're going through those notes, as you're going through those op reports, whatever, you want to make sure you're familiar enough with the term so that you're not looking up every single medical term in that note because that'll help pick up your speed. Let's see. This may be off topic. What, what tips can you suggest for someone who wants to start creating content on your YouTube channel? So there's a couple of really great resources that I used starting out. So I would look up Think Media. They helped me with the tech side of it, like how to get uh, your cameras together, how to get your lighting together. Now mine certainly is not always perfect, but uh, I think for what I do, it probably doesn't need to be 100% perfect. Think Media is great because they'll tell you like, oh, if you're starting up a YouTube channel today, you're going to want to buy the Canon EOS M50. That's the most popular camera for doing vlogs or YouTube channels. It's $600, but if you don't have that money, like here's how you can take your phone and make an entire YouTube video out of it. And if you have 20 bucks, here's a budget-friendly mic you can make. Um, so Think Media has been really great. Um, there's uh, Catherine, Catherine Manning. She used to be known as the content bug and she's helped me out a lot with style and how to get set up on a YouTube channel and stuff. Just really good tips and tutorials for that. So the next question that I have 
<laughs> oh, I love this one. Do your high school grades and GPA matter? I didn't get the best GPA in high school, and honestly, I didn't <laughs> did terrible in high school, but I really want to get into this career field and do medical coding schools check that kind of stuff. They don't, uh, thank God, because I was not a great student either myself. I, you know, a little bit of a personal background story. When I was a freshman in high school, my best friend's father committed suicide, and that was a really hard, hard thing. And just for the sake of trying to keep her together, you know, we were skipping classes a lot. I wound up failing classes. Then she moved across the country and I had to mentally recuperate from that. So I just, you know, I just had a lot going on, didn't really care too much. I had horrible grades in high school um, and it took me a while to really pick myself up and dust myself off and get into this groove and then find medical coding. So community college and technical schools, generally speaking, like as long as you can open up the door, they'll let you in. They do sometimes what I, I believe are like placement tests Well, they'll say, okay, we want you to take this test and this isn't, you're getting in or you're not getting in. And I apologize, I think there's a lawnmower going by right now. Um, it's not you're getting in, you're not getting in. It's do you need to take any um, entry level Englishes or any entry level maths? Like where do we need to place you as far as math or English? Now, even if you're not gonna go through a traditional school, you can go through like a coding instructor or through the AAPC and get their prep courses, get add on med term, add on anatomy and physiology and go from there and they're not, they're not checking anything. They're not worried about your GPA or your grades. I've never ever been asked in any position I've ever interviewed for about my grades in high school, about my grades when I was in school for medical coding, nothing. It's never, never come up. Not once. I don't, honestly, I don't think I even got asked what my, oh, you know what? I, they didn't score them at the time. I was going to say, I didn't even get asked what my score was on my CPC exam, but actually when I took it, they didn't score it. It was pass fail. So someone's asking me, <clears throat> I'm scheduled to take my CPC exam next month. Assuming I do pass, will I be awarded a CPCA? How easy hard is it to get a job as a CPCA? So there's, if you do not have two years experience or meet certain criteria, you are considered a certified professional coding assistant, which means that you have to have your A removed after you've met those requirements or gotten two years of experience so there's other ways to kind of eliminate that that need for two full years of experience. One is if you go through an AAPC approved instructor, so that's one thing you can do. It will take off, if you do 80 contact hours with them of education time, it can take off a year of experience. So when you're looking for independent instructors online, that's a good thing to look at is if they are an AAPC approved instructor that will allow you to take off a year of experience through your apprenticeship. The other thing is they have the Practicode, which you do have to pay for. I wanna say it's $300, don't quote me on that. But the Practicode is uh, several different, uh, I think it, it takes a couple of months to finish it, but they're real life redacted medical cases that you code from scratch. And once you're done with that Practicode, it will take off one year of your experience. So you could technically do maybe one year of experience and then do the Practicode and that would remove your uh, apprenticeship status. Or you could go through an approved instructor and do the Practicode and that will remove your apprenticeship status or any combination of those to get that two year requirement. Is it hard to get a job? You know, the, the, the medical coding field in general is difficult to find jobs in. And I like to make the comparison about RNs. RNs are very regimented. There are state guidelines that they have to follow, that they have to do so many, you know, um, clinical hours, do so many procedures, demonstrate so much proficiency, and then they take a very regulated examination on a computer to get their, their registered nurse or even their LPN. So there are, there are governmental steps that they need to take. Medical coding's not as regimented. So the problem is we have people that just are really good exam takers and they took some cruddy, you know, boot camp over the weekend and kind of fast-tracked their way because they're good exam takers through their CPC exam. 
So employers have to be very careful when they're selecting new candidates to find out if this is someone who really went through a proper program or if this is someone who kind of just um, was really good at taking that exam that maybe they had someone that went, yeah, when you see this, do this, do this, do this. Um, in the past, there's some people that have not been entirely uh, ethical about when they proctor exams for students and things. So there's just a little bit of reluctancy for some employers because of that. They don't want to accidentally hire someone who doesn't understand things like the billing regulations or guidelines or state guidelines and why they wind up losing money because of that because that's that's their risk if they hire someone who's not a good coder but maybe pass their exam because they're a good test taker they could actually lose money right out of their pockets because of denials or things get fined in an audit and they wind up having to pay back out so it is it is a little bit hard especially remote remote jobs right off the bat when you're certified are, are harder to find and we talked a little bit earlier that that might change. I do, I would foresee if it, you know, just my personal prediction, I think the guidelines are gonna ease up a little bit about hiring people remotely. But the other thing I will tell you about remote positions is there are specific requirements. You know, a lot of these people that, that hire remote coders, you have to sign a contract, you have to have certain equipment in your house. They don't want you sitting on your couch watching Netflix coding charts. You have to have, some of them require dual monitors, meaning you have to have two different monitors. Uh, you have to have like a fire extinguisher in your house. You have to have smoke alarms set up. You have to be logged in at certain hours. You have to have, you know, books or whatever various equipment that they, they mandate that you have in order to get a remote position. Um, how do you increase your job prospects or get more certifications? Which certification do I request after the CPC? So I think you cast a very wide net if you get the CPC and the CPB, which is the billing certification, because that way you can get a job in billing and maybe work your way up to coding. Uh, I also like the CRC certification. There's been a lot of job postings for risk adjustment coders, specifically because of provider contracts changing. So it used to be that a lot of the risk adjustment coding positions were just through insurance companies. And that is still where a majority of them, I would say, are. But now these insurance companies are writing into the provider contracts that will give you, you know, a 2% quarterly bonus or what have you based off of your risk adjustment coding scores, if you're capturing all those high risk conditions, those HCCs. So now we're starting to see this transition where healthcare organizations are hiring risk adjustment coders to look at provider documentation specifically to make sure that they are abstracting those high risk HCC diagnoses and that they're reporting them out once a year to those insurances so that they get those extra bonuses. So there's, there's a, been a big uptake, uptick in risk adjustment coding too. Quick question, have you known anyone who has done Project Extern? You know what, that's a very good question. Actually, I don't. If anyone in the chat knows anyone who has done something through Project Extern, leave it in the chat comments. Um, because personally, I don't know, any, I've, I've known a couple of people that I've directed that to um, and have spoken about Project Extern, but I personally don't know anyone that's gone through that program. I do know the AAPC also has a mentorship program and I, I I've heard people talk about the mentees that they're taking and that that's really helping them out. So that's something you could look into too. The AAPC does have a mentorship program. I don't know exactly where to find it on their website, but I do know it is there. Someone asked, is it possible to code for mental health? Yes, so there's a lot of coding for mental health. And I do know some coders that just concentrate on mental health conditions. There is a, a pretty good need for that. And I think in my local area, there's been a lot more facilities opening up for mental health uh, patients. And I think that's another area where there'll probably be a high demand because there isn't really a lot of concentration on mental health. The AAPC has some, I think they have do have a course on mental health coding but it's not as in-depth as I think some of these specialty organizations and specialty trainers have. So I would, I would foresee there being a higher demand probably coming in the next couple of years for mental health coding. <coughs> um, 
someone saying, I just finished my medical billing and coding course a few weeks ago and was able to get a foot in the door as a billing specialist rather than strictly as a coder. I haven't yet sat for my CPC yet. So that's why I say a lot of times you can start out in billing. So if, if an organization sees that you have your CPB too, that you've demonstrated some sort of proficiency already in medical billing, that can really help out. The community college I'm looking at, um, is looked at highly in my town. It's an AAPC program. It says the certificate is CPC, CPCA. Do you know why it would be listed as CPC, CPCA? So the reason it would be listed as CPC or CPCA depends on your experience. So if you have two years experience in healthcare or doing something in coding already, you would be a CPC. If you don't have two years experience already, you would be a CPCA, Certified Professional Coder Apprentice. So if someone takes that program, same as you, but they've been working in healthcare billing and coding for you know the past four years, they'll get the CPC, but you won't because you don't have the experience. So you're considered an apprentice coder. Do medical coders use two computers on the job? So they don't usually use two computers, but medical coders do use two monitors. I actually have what I call them the ultra wide monitor where it's almost like a, maybe a monitor and a third um, so instead of having two monitors where I've got center points here and here, I just have one like extra big monitor. I've seen people even use big screen TVs as their monitors. You can, um, everything's pretty much HDMI outputs these days. So you just plug in one HDMI cord to your computer or your laptop and the other to the big screen TV and you're kind of good to go. Um, I like the big ultra wide monitor because I have vertigo. So for me to shift my focus back and forth, back and forth can easily make me very dizzy. Um, plus, you know, I have my, my webcam right here. So that's right at the center. And if I had two monitors, I, I, I mean, I guess I could get a tripod and stick that there. But first, uh, for me, I, I like it that way. I've seen some medical coders that have quite a number of monitors. I think more and more that's a little bit for show. Um, but there are some that maybe they'll have, you know, their billing system over here and then their chart over here and then others maybe they'll want to have like their encoder or something else that they're looking up codes or cci edits or something on a third monitor so i can see it um for me that would drive me crazy i i, I get dizzy and fall over i absolutely would <laughs> um, i personally though do have two computers but only because i have my work stuff and then i have a separate personal computer because i don't you know i shouldn't be doing personal stuff on my work computer the computer I have is actually, uh, because I do video editing and all the video work, it's a gaming laptop. It's the Asus Zephyrus S Ultra Slim Gaming Laptop. It's very, very good for processing video and stuff. So generally medical coders don't need that, but I, because of my use on social media, uh, use a, a more video heavy and, and processing heavy computer. In most cases, and this is, this is actually a great question because I get asked this a lot, People will say, well, what kind of computer should I get as a medical coder? Honestly, for most medical coding, just general purposes, you could get like a cheap Chromebook for, from Walmart or Newegg or Amazon for just a couple of hundred bucks. It doesn't really need to be anything super, super fancy just for medical coding. You know, I think the key is making sure that you have the two monitors, but you can, the laptop wise, and a lot of remote positions, um, if that's what you're gunning for, will supply you with a laptop, others, you know, not. And you have to be very careful too about, you know, um, security networks. That's another thing with remote coding is they wanna make sure that your neighbor's not gonna hop onto your Wi-Fi and steal all the patient information that's on your computer. So there's certain uh, logins and things that you have to be very careful of. And I personally too, um, like I keep my door closed and keep things in locked drawers because you know, my, even, even my kids should not be coming in here and looking at patient records or whatever, not that she would or, or have any sort of interest in them, uh, but I shouldn't have my screen displayed that people coming and visiting can see any patient information or charts that I would have on my screen. Someone's asking, do I know what the CEU increase is for each additional AAPC certification? Off the top of my head, I don't. The nice thing though is, is if they're core credentials, usually any CEU will go to all of your core credentials, but only some will go to a specialty. So the core credentials are like your CPC, your CPB, uh, your COC, CIC, CRC, 
and I think the CPPM, and then there's the compliance one, which is the CPCO. So I think a lot of them will still go to the core credentials, maybe compliance, not so much. I'm not sure, so sure. But a lot of the core coding ones, you can use them uh, like the same one for your CPC and it also go to your CPB, I think. So there's some, some double dipping that you're allowed to do for, as far as CEUs now. I would definitely check the AAPC website because I'm sure that'll be a little bit better than I am right now. And I don't want to switch over to my uh, cam for my other screen because I don't want to accidentally lose something. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else have we got? But yeah, you do, you do need to have extra CEUs for each certification. I think they do cap out at a certain point. Oh, someone says she's asking for an ICD-10 book for her birthday since she's so interested. <laughs> That's fascinating. I really like that, yeah. Um, and it's good to get them early. If you pre-order them before the code changes, usually you get a better discount. Um, where do you start as a medical coder? Do you take CPT courses at the beginning or is it a mixture of courses that you have to take? Usually if you're starting from scratch that you've not worked in healthcare before, they'll start you out with like med term, anatomy, some places will include pharmacology. Um, and then what they usually do is start out with ICD-10 CM coding and then get into CPT and then HIC picks. I think the AAPC curriculum, what it does is it starts you out with the business of healthcare, so just how things work in the business sort of environment. Um, you know, what is a, a CMS 1500 form? Um, how do you work on claims? You know, what is the, the business tactics of medical coding? And then it goes into a little bit of med term and then it starts getting into ICD-10 CM coding, all the different guidelines there, which I'll be going over in various videos. And then it gets into CPT and then also the coordinating ICD-10 CM codes that work with that and then into HICS-PEX. What's the purpose of using two monitors? That's a great question. So it's because you have to shift between windows a lot. So instead of having to close your billing screen and then open up your note and then look at it and then go open up your other uh, billing screen and go, what were the codes I was gonna put in? Um, what you can do is you just have like your, your note here that you're looking at and you can go, okay, hypertension I-10 and look at your screen over here with your billing system and just punch it in. And that way you're not trying to remember things as you're opening and closing windows because you can have both of those windows open at the same time and start transitioning things over. So that's a lot of what it's for. Or if you're coding something out and you need to look at a guideline over here so you can have one window open with your coding guidelines and then another window open here with your note that you're abstracting the codes from. Do remote coder employers consider 12 years experience on site from 12 years experience 10 years ago as experience or is the two years still required it would really depend on that employer you know i've never seen any specific regulations or uh, restrictions on the years requirement so i'll see it just generally will say we need two years experience um, I would imagine that if they bring you in for an interview, they would want you to explain why you've not had medical coding in 10 years. And the other thing you have to also consider is within the past 10 years, we've also changed our ICD coding system from ICD-9 to ICD-10. So I would anticipate that they would want you to um, have updated training in ICD-10-CM. Uh, Da, 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 da. Someone is saying that right now AAPC is offering 50% of prep course and free books to Labor Day. Yeah, definitely keep an eye on those sales that they have on the AAPC. Another trick I'll tell you is usually towards Black Friday is when they start getting rid of some of their study guides and things. So you can often find uh, study guides for like really, really cheap, 50, 60, 70% off. And sometimes they don't change that substantially from year to year so that you can still kind of study with the prior year study guide and then just get new practice exams or something. Um, or just kind of know that there's maybe some codes that have changed in there in the meantime. So if you're looking to maybe get your CRC or your COC or your CPB, know that usually towards Black Friday, they have a lot of really good sales because they're trying to get rid of their, their inventory. Heather says, thank you for your series on ENM coding. They really helped me in a second interview yesterday. You are so welcome, Heather. 
Uh, and uh, don't forget if you have other coding friends that you know might benefit from them, make sure that you share that video with them so that they can get some familiarity with ENM too. I always love to see when people are, are sharing the videos and also don't forget to hit that that thumbs up for the for the like button. So that helps my algorithm. So when you thumbs up those videos and you subscribe, um, even when people give thumbs down actually, it helps show that there's engagement, which means that when people go on to YouTube and search for medical coding, it, it my videos will, will pull to the top for them. So that way when they're searching and they find me, like I'm already there and can help out more people. Robin's saying, did you say you're hoping to launch a CPC course in the near future? If so, are you going to have students use the Burke step-by-step -step book? So one second, let me get another drink. So <clears throat> I do love the step-by-step -step medical coding books. I think they're awesome. I used to teach with them when I taught uh, a few years ago at Burke's Technical Institute near me. But what I'm going to do is instead of using the Bucks step-by-step -step books, since it's an AAPC program, since you will go through the AAPC approved curriculum, that will allow you to take that Time, that year off of your apprenticeship. So in order to do that though, you have to go through the AAPC's approved curriculum, which is what I'll be te uh, training on instead of the step-by-step. -step. So I'm still trying to figure out tooling as far as what I wanna price it and what I wanna include in that price because you know, if you already have a CPT book and an ICD-10 book and all that, I don't wanna have a big bundle and then you wind up with duplicate books or if you already have a study guide or something. So I'm trying to figure in if I want to include the study guide and the textbook as part of the fee and ship those out because there are separate things that you're going to have to purchase through my um, contact at the AAPC if you need them, like if you need coding books, if you need a membership because you don't have one already. Um, so I, I, I'm still trying to figure out the bundle and pricing information. But yeah, so that's I'm, I'm hoping to launch that next month so it should be available and like I'm I'm including med term in it and I already love that crash course so much on AMP that instead of trying to do my own thing with AMP I'm basically going to refer you back to the crash course and say here's some supplemental information some quizzes and things based off of that so that you can test your proficiency in AMP and if you're you're taking on the information from that too and then also suggest extra resources that you can use on top of that <sighs> I, oh, this is a great question. I am doing my an online course. Will I be able to use my 2020 books in 2021? So if you go into Google and type in AAPC exam FAQs, it will take you to the frequently asked questions for all of the AAPC certification examinations, and it will tell you what year's books you're allowed to use. So what it essentially tells you is that if you are training now in 2020, but you're not taking your books until 2021, you are still allowed to take your 2020 books. You can also take your 2021 books. So you can take the current year and you can take the prior year's books. What you can't do, however, is take the next year's books. So if I'm testing in November or December and I already have my 2021 books, I can't take the 2021 books. I can only take the current year or the prior year's books, not the year for the next year. Even if I have them ahead of time, you have to be either current year or previous year's books for when you're sitting for your exam. The exam actually does not change until January of that year. So even though the uh, ICD-10-CM codes will update between October and, um, well, well, they'll update on October 1st. So that, that won't be reflected in the exam until January. Okay, so I hope that answered a lot of your questions that you had today. I think I got to all of them and I just wanna say thank you so much to all of you that signed in today for the live chat and those of you that have uh, membership, don't forget you have your custom emojis. I haven't, I haven't seen the custom emojis used yet. Where is your Victoria uh, emojis with me holding the CPT book? I was just holding my CPT up. You should have used your custom emojis. So I'm gonna take, I think, oh, I just saw two more questions come in. Um, someone said that they did practice exercises on Quizlet. Be careful with that Quizlet because I've heard some people say that they found some things on there that are 
not correct, if there may be old information or someone didn't understand the concept correctly. So just be, be a little cautious about some of that free stuff you get online. And then someone says, which books would you recommend for specialty, like C-H-O-N-C exam practice questions? <sighs> the specialty books. So if you're talking about just coding books, I like, you know, you have to have the AMA edition of CPT. That's the only one you're allowed to have. If you're not, if you're talking about additional resources, because I know for some of the specialty exams, you're allowed to take an additional special resource and they don't define what that is. If you have something that's about oncology coding, you know, make sure you take that with. Um, as far as ICD-10-CMs, what's the one I have right now? Oh, Optum 360. I love, I like my Optum 360 ICD-10-CM book because it has the guidelines at the front of each chapter. So that's one of my, my absolute, absolute favorites. So I think they make a really, really good ICD-10-CM book. If you need help tabbing, I do have a tabbing video on my channel as well. So make sure you check that out. It will show you how to put the 50,000 tabs on your books if you so choose. So that's it. Uh, everyone, thank you so much again for coming in. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up. And if you aren't subscribed, I would really hope you would consider subscribing to my channel. And if you're interested, there's also a membership you can join that will unlock additional information, uh, additional content, additional community posts. And you even if you get the uh, gold tier, I'll add your name onto the end credits of the videos. Not this one, because I can't don't think I can add them onto the live streams. But thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. And I will see you all soon. I almost forgot. Keep on coding on.